welcome to today's genealogy program. I'm Jessica Ashton uh, with the Royal Gorge Regional Museum and History Center coming to you from City Hall. Uh, today is September 9th, 2023, and today's topic is Sanborn Maps. So um, I have a few announcements. I think I'll save those for the end. So without uh, further ado, I'll hand it over to our presenter, Terry Meeks. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, today is kind of a little bit of a history-making event. This is the 36th Zoom presentation that I have done. And if you would go to the um, museum's YouTube page, YouTube, and then enter Royal Gorge Regional Museum and History Center, you will see most of the videos that I have done. If you happen to see a topic or not see a topic, um, it would be very interesting if you would contact the museum and suggest further topics for exploration and programs. So without further ado, we'll start and talk about Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. My mouse is not turning. There we go. I'm sorry. So what are Sanborn maps? Officially, they are fire insurance maps. Um, and most of them cover um, cities, large cities, as well as small cities. And they are done in a large scale format. They usually cover just a matter of a few blocks. They were developed by the Sanborn Map Company. And as the title fire insurance implies, um, they were to insist, assist insurance companies to assess the risk um, and actually the liability. And it allowed them to then calculate the premiums for their policies in the various communities. The largest collection of these maps is at the Library of Congress. And the Library of Congress has online only those that are in the public domain. There are many other insurance maps um, for this purpose that have not come into the public domain and are owned by individual libraries or state archives. What they show about 12,000 towns and cities are covered in the entire collection. And they come in either volumes or individual sheets. And when you take those volumes into account, there are approximately 700,000 individual sheets, individual maps um, that are covered by this. As I mentioned, depending on the size of the city, they may cover a four to six block range. In some cases, it may only be two or three square blocks. It does give you the information. Um, it describes the town. And because it's for fire insurance, we're going to see a lot about water and what the capability for fighting fires might be in each of these towns. It will give the size and the shape and the construction of the buildings and whether those buildings are private homes, commercial buildings, factories, um, most of those are covered. It will also give the widths and the names of streets and it will also show property boundaries. London was very famous for their fires, and they were the first ones to come up with the idea of fire insurance and drawing fire insurance maps. And this was as early as the late 
18th century. So even in the late 1700s, they were drawing fire insurance maps. The Sanborn Company was started by a surveyor named Daniel Sanborn in 1866, and he was contracted by the Aetna Insurance Company to uh, draw maps of uh, certain areas of Tennessee, and that's how his business got started. He was not the only fire insurance map maker. Um, but during the Civil War, with the rapid expansion of population and industrialization, the number of maps and the call for these fire insurance maps grew. I met, my mouse is not cooperating this morning. I apologize. Okay, finally. It did allow insurance companies to assess the risk without leaving their office. This was the first time people used to have to do in-person inspections going up and down the city streets to assess the liability should a fire um, happen. And these maps and these collections of maps for the first time allowed insurance companies to stay in their offices and to underwrite those policies. By the early 20th century, Sanborn had a, a monopoly on these insurance maps. He actually bought out several of the other smaller companies and um, established the monopoly. During the financial downturn in the early 20th century, construction uh, fell by the wayside. And so the Sanborn Map Company didn't have a requirement to produce as many of the volumes as they previously had. So it dwindled from 60 volumes per year to about 20. By the 1950s, um, insurance companies had different forms for developing their underwriting procedures. So there was no longer a real need for the Sanborn maps. And the last one was published as late as 1977. In addition to the United States, Sanborn maps do cover some areas of Canada, Quebec, and Mexico. So how are these maps organized? Many of them are published in volumes. The larger cities might have multiple volumes, understandably. And smaller towns, such as Canyon City, might simply have one or two loose leaf pages. The maps were not published every year. They were published on kind of a random uh, basis. Larger cities might be incorporated on a, a much greater scale than the smaller towns just because of size. But between the uh, production of various editions, updates might have been sent as correction slips or slip sheets. And these were usually pasted on top of the old original maps. Since I mentioned that these are mostly housed um, at the, or the Library of Congress has the largest collection of them, their arrangement at the Library of Congress is by state, then by city, and then each volume is listed chronologically. And it does give the number of pages that are in a particular volume. So you know how many maps you're going to need to look at to find exactly what you're looking for.
there on larger towns and communities, you're going to find a decorative title page. You might also have an index of the streets and various important addresses within the town. There will be, in some cases, a master index and a specials index. And the specials index cover institutions, factories, et cetera, and also has any special notations of hazards. We are talking about fire maps. So if there was a business that had some kind of hazard with respect to fire, those might appear in the specials index. It does give a lot of general information about the uh, population, the economy, with respect to fire, the prevailing direction of wind. And also we'll see a lot of information about water sources to fight fires. All of the maps do have a key and it is very important to look at that key. Um, to see how to interpret the colors and the various symbols on the maps. So how does a genealogist use these maps? It does show the development of cities and towns. So where your ancestor lived, was there originally a wooden building that then became a brick building and then went on to become a stone structure? Did it go from one story to two stories? So you can see the development of the community. It allows you to look at various neighborhoods and perhaps at the home where your own ancestor might have lived. It allows you to look at family businesses. Um, did you have a family member who owned the business at 101 Main Street? And during the time period, you know, how long were they there? What were the previous businesses? And what might have been any succeeding businesses and the changes in the structure? They also do record the change in street names and the numbering of streets. Um, towns frequently as they developed might have changed the street names. They might have renamed them. In many cases, they also renumbered the streets and we'll see an example of that. And it allows you to look at the property, the dwelling and perhaps the place of work for your particular relatives. It's through these maps that you can augment your family history story. As I've mentioned, the Library of Congress, especially online, does have the largest collection. They do have some in their collection um, that are not available online state archives, local libraries, university libraries, historical societies. Our museum here in Canyon City has a collection of Canyon City um, Sanborn maps. Because of copyright, those available at the Library of Congress online date prior to 1922. And when we go to that site, we will see the difference and um, what is restricted. I'm going to pause here for a second if you want to take a screenshot so you can get the actual um, Library of Congress website to access Sanborn insurance maps, or you can log, go into your uh, browser and just type Sanborn insurance maps or Sanborn fire insurance maps. And the first um, usually result is the Library of Congress website so that you can get direct access to their system. 
And this is what that screen looks like. This is just the top of the page. Below this page, there is also an, um, an insert box that has further uh, direct links to other descriptive topics on how to use these maps. Um, for example, there is one for um, keys and colors that explains how the what colors are used. Um, there is a separate one for symbols to outline what symbols you might find within the insurance maps. But we're going to take a look and see how to actually access the maps. You don't need to select a country. Um, the United States is the default. If you wanted to look at Canada, Mexico, or Cuba, you would have to enter that. What we're going to do is first select a state. And in this, I have actually selected Colorado. And I get a listing of the communities in Colorado. This is not the complete list partial list. Um, and you will notice that there are asterisks at the end of these. That indicates that they do have Sanborn maps online for your viewing. You will also see that there are a couple of communities like Center and um, that do not have the asterisk. It means that there are Sanborn maps available, but they are not online. Here is the page I selected Canyon City. And you can see that we have the dates for the maps and you can see the number of pages that are included in each volume. You can automatically see the growth of the community as time passes. They have links, direct links to the various maps, the various volumes. And we notice that per the copyright after 1922, they are not available online. They are still under copyright. You can write to the Library of Congress and they will make copies to send to you. So I happen to have chosen the September 1883 map, and we saw from the previous page that there were two pages for those maps. So let's take a look at the first page. The first page is usually going to give you that important key for understanding. And we do have that first page. And we see we've got Main Street, um, we've got River Street, Main, and Macon, and we're going between third and fourth, second. So we've got maybe a three by six block. We have an inset for another area that apparently didn't fit on the second page, and rather than go to a third page, they've put it as an inset. We have this key down at the bottom, and we're going to look at these more closely. And we have the courthouse, and we have descriptive information on the maps. Here is that all important key that does describe our buildings. We see that we have a solid line here with a small perpendicular line at the end. That indicates a firewall six inches above the roof. So these are all clues for you to follow. We have how many floors, what types of roof construction materials are being used. We've got a dotted line for a frame partition. We see if there's a steam boiler in the building, we've got an iron door with an opening. 
We've got descriptions of windows and shutters. X's usually mark stables. The symbols to indicate where windows might be placed. And the all important description of the type of exterior construction. Is the building a frame building, brick, stone, or is there some form of special construction? They do give some heights in um, uh, some examples, and they have other notations. Each one of the maps has its own key. For the most part, the key is very similar across the board on all of the maps. But sometimes in a particular community, there are unique features um, that are described in the key. So always look at the key. Here is the blow up of the 1883 um, Canyon City map. Um, we essentially have Main Street and we have the buildings along 3rd and coming up to 4th Street. We see that the street itself is 100 feet wide. And note the numbering for the buildings in 1883. These are listed as 600s, whereas now they are 300s. We see the McClure Hotel. We see its brick construction. It's a three-story building, and it contains other stores within it. It has a two-story dining room on the back and a kitchen. We see the kind of roof that it has. We have hash marks for windows, um, different kind of roofing material. And across the street, we have the Reynolds Bank and the McGee Grocery Store that's really brick with a stone facade. We also see stairways, some um, wooden frame structures. We see the various businesses that are located, groceries maybe on the first floor, print shops on the second floor. So we get an idea of what the community might have looked like back in 1883. These maps are downloadable onto your computer just simply by going down on the page to the download options. And depending on the um, density or the number of pixels that you want to uh, the clarity of the map, you can download at a very low level or at an extremely high level, depending on how you want to use the map. And here is that Reynolds building with the stone facade and the former grocery store with the stone facade over brick. What if you can't find the town name? What if, for example, Canyon City was not listed um, immediately in the directory? Um, you can also go to um, the full text um, field and enter a community name. And that's exactly what I did. Um, Water Valite is in New York State, the Water Valite that I know, but it did not appear in the listing for New York State. So I wanted to see whether there were indeed any maps for it. And by simply entering that, I find that there is a Water Valite, Michigan, and that perhaps they are covered in the Troy, New York section. 
by clicking on that, I do find that Water Valete is covered in the 1903 volume, along with Green Island and I assume Troy. There are 82 pages in this particular volume. So it's going to take some exploration. If you have family that lived in an extremely large city like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, how do you find your street in one of those situations? Here again, let me pause so that you can make a copy of this volume finder address um, because this is a very helpful uh, tool that the Library of Congress has developed um, for you. This is a listing of their very large cities that they have covered in the volume finder. They are continuing to do more work to add cities to this. They do have, they do, uh, by clicking on it, you can get to a map and you just select a city by clicking one of those red icons. From there, by going to the magnifying glass, you get this screen that gives you an overall viewing. And by select, hovering over the city, you then can select the pin and then you select here. And this will lead you to further instructions. Click the I'm ready. And it allows you to enter an address. So if you have information for, from a census, for example, and you're looking in a large city to see what kind of building was that, um, you have maps from different time periods, and you can enter the address. When I entered one of the addresses from New York City for one of my relatives um, in the early 1900s, I see that there are approximately three different, two of them are 47 Attorney Street, one is in New York, one is in Hempstead, but one is just the general attorney street. So if I choose the actual um, address that I'm looking for, it does pinpoint um, that address. And by clicking on the map, I then get the volume number and it's from 1905. By selecting the here, I then get the listing of 98 maps uh, for that particular area. Here again, you've got a cover sheet with a key and I see an actual mapping on two. So I'm going to try map number two. And I do see where Attorney Street is listed. And here again, I have only 98 pages to search through, which is considerably less than the thousands, but I have the volume number that I know. And by going back to that initial page and scanning the maps, I can usually come up with where region number 26 map number 26 will appear. It may indeed be map number 26 in the sequence, but it also may not be.
So if there is no map at the Library of Congress, uh, the University of California at Berkeley has come up with what they call the Union List of Sanborn Maps. And this will be a listing of where you can find these maps. They, in most cases, they will not be online, um, but they will be held in private university collections, private collections, et cetera. But here again, you can write to the place and get copies if you need them. And here is that union list. And you will see here again, symbol, similar notation that if there is an asterisk, they may be available, some are available online. For those that do not have the asterisks, we notice that they do not have them online. I chose um, Georgia just as a state. And we see, for example, that Abbeville in Wilcox County, there are Sanborn maps for these years. What, how many sheets are involved in each of those and the library that does contain copies of these maps and so on. So. So let's take a look at how you can advance your family story. Do you know um, what all your ancestors' homes or businesses might have looked like, um, especially at the turn of the last century, early 1900, late 1800s? Um, how do, has the construction changed? Were there improvements? Were there additions to the buildings? And looking at the development of the town and the neighborhood in which your family might have lived, um, were they the first family on the block? And then in subsequent years, more buildings were established. So this is one of my family, uh, family situations. These are three sisters whose parents um, have died and they are living together at 165 Front Street in Troy, New York. Like Canyon City, Troy has maintained many of their old buildings. And when using Sanborn maps, um, along with other websites, other information that you have gathered about your ancestors, you really can advance their story. So, I had to use Google Maps to actually pinpoint and understand where First Street fell and where 165 First Street fell um, within the Troy, New York community. The Hudson River is um, to the west and Washington Park, fortunately, was a uh, large landmark so that when I went looking for the Sanborn map, I knew what cross streets to look for and to uh, locate the appropriate map. I'm sorry for the confusion on this, but I actually did um, enter 165 First Street, Troy, New York into Google Maps and the building still exists. So I actually got a picture of it. Um, by looking at Zillow, I find that the building is kind of in derelict shape. But it's really interesting to see that underneath some kind of overcover, we see um, what was underneath and perhaps what was there in 1900 as far as wall covering was concerned. And there were many other pictures that actually showed the very poor condition that this building is in. The Sanborn maps do not always have the same orientation that 
um, the north-south Google Maps do. So you have to be willing to uh, be able to turn and adjust. So we did see that Washington was one of the cross streets um, to the north of first. And because we were in from the river, this happens to actually be first street. And we do see a number of homes, similar to the picture we saw from the Google, um, that show the brick structures. So let's home in and find number 165, which is right here. We see that it's a three-story building. From the picture we saw, it was indeed a three-story building. The circle, the hollow circle, indicates that it has a slate roof. In the back, there is a two-story wooden structure, and it's two stories on the back side. We have stairs going up to the front and windows, three windows to the front. We have a two-story stable in the back with a single-story wooden structure um, in front of it. From the key, we see that this key is a little different than the one we saw for Canyon City, but it does give primarily the same information. We've got the firewalls that are above the roof. We have the different colors for the constructions of construction of the building. We note that the gray is an iron building, so that is a one of the special keyed pieces of information. We have um, our stables. We have whether we've got steam boilers and whether they're horizontal or vertical. Chimneys, the kinds of chimneys that they might have. So um, And as I have mentioned, we have the pink. We've got a brick building. It's three stories. It's got a slate roof. We've got the yellow frame structures, the two-story, we've got the stable, and we've got our windows. This is one of the major employers in the late 1800s um, in Troy, New York. This is the Burden Iron Works, and they made bells like the Liberty Bell and it was a huge complex. I had several relatives. These are not all my relatives. These are some additional folks, but we see iron rollers, puddlers, iron mill hand, a rivet cutter, and an iron molder. These people probably all worked at the Burden Iron Works. Is there someone in your family that worked at one of these large manufacturing places? Here again, we see the key from Troy, New York. And we find the page that shows the Burden Ironworks. What's really interesting about that is the picture that I just showed you is this small building. So we can see the scale and the size of the Burden Ironworks. And not only is it um, on this page, it's also on this page. We see the waterways, just like we did see in the first map of Canyon City. Waterways are going to be one of your key uh, accesses 
for firefighting. And if they have hydrants at this time, and they usually, and they did, um, other water sources for pumpers might have been necessary. It is really interesting to see the construction brick, couple of wooden structures or wood on the interior. From our key, we know that all of these are boilers. These are horizontal boilers. And we have a whole series of them here. So we see this line of uh, boilers as well. And I actually found an old picture of the complex. And the two maps that we just saw refer to only this portion of the burden works. These smokestacks that we see down here are indeed this building here. So we can find out from the insurance map exactly what was going on in this particular building. It is the Puddling Forge, I believe. And you can compare each one of these buildings to the map that we just saw to see the construction and to get an idea, if your people were working there, which of the buildings they might have been working in to uh, perform their unique functions. This water wheel is also from the Burden um, Iron Works. The water wheel was originally indoors. So it gives you an idea of how large the building must have been. The building it, itself was destroyed um, in the mid 1900s and the water wheel indeed has also gone by the wayside. I was interested, this happens to be a photograph. This is my mother in about second grade, um, in about 1915. Interestingly enough, the little boy that's picking his nose down here went on to become the mayor of her hometown. <laughs> but I was looking at the building and I was curious. I could not find any indication of what school my mother had gone to in second grade. I knew um, what school she had gone to as far as high school was concerned because the town only had a single high school. So I wanted to dig a little deeper. Here is a map of Cohoes, New York. This is one of the title pages. Not everyone has a title page. And this one does have an index as well with the listing of streets and other prominent properties. There's historical information. We've got the key. And at the time, I knew that the family lived on Amity Street, which is right here. And um, actually, map number 22 was the 22nd map in the series of Sanborn maps for Cohoes, New York. So that made it very easy. From there, I went to the index. And I did notice that they had the listing of public schools. Since my mother lived in 22, I tried to look for one that was in close proximity to her home. So 
So apparently there was a school in 19 and there was there were two schools in 25. The others uh, that were listed, their numbers did not appear on this particular map. So I eliminated those from contention. From family stories that my mother told and from actual visits years ago to the community, Columbia Street was a very, busy, very busy street. Um, it's probably three lanes wide. And at the time when my mother was living there, there was a streetcar that went up and down. So I didn't think that she would have, even though this 19 would be the closest school, I did not feel that it was the safest one for her to walk to as a second grader. She also talked about the fact that she walked uphill in the snow both ways to go to school um, and to come home. And I know that Columbia Street has a very steep hill. So I concentrated on area 25. Looking at our key, which is virtually identical to previous ones that we have seen, I found that public school number seven and public school number eight were attached to one another. We didn't learn a whole heck of a lot. We know that it's a brick building. And from the photograph, we already knew that it was a brick building. It is a two-story building. And we could see from the photograph where there were some students sitting in the window, um, probably on the first floor. And we've got windows on the front. So um, probably a staircase to enter. Um, there are notes that say that there's the heat is as a result of steam and that there are no lights. Um, there's a slate or a tin roof, our hollowed circle, and we've got the small wooden part, excuse me, that connects the two schools. So either one or the other, further investigation to follow. If you happen to live in an old community or your ancestors lived in an old community, how has the development of the town um, influenced their work, their lives, their businesses? And what did the town look like when they might have initially settled there? What are the changes that have happened? Uh, what are the expansions? We've seen how maps May our towns may start with only two maps, but then burgeon to 10, 20, 50 maps. We get the develop, development of business and also the advancement perhaps in industrial or factories. This happens to be my husband's hometown. And we see as early as 1894 that the buildings in the town are wooden structures. We see what kinds of businesses are located in them. And we have a little notation for some water features, which are going to disappear. So within less than 20 years, we see the development of the town. It's the same map, but now we see brick buildings having replaced many of those wooden structures. We even have a stone building that has now replaced it. And 
a matter of another less than 20 years, most of the wooden structures have disappeared. What are the changes in the businesses that have gone on? Who's occupying these storefronts now? This is part of augmenting your family story. So we come to the end of our um, discussion of Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. And we've seen how you can look at either your own ancestor's individual home, how it might have changed, how it might have stayed the same, what the hometown and the neighborhood might have looked like. And it gives you a context of what their workplace might have been like. So try and use Sanborn maps. Think of ways that they can um, augment your family story and add a new dimension to it. So with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. Yes, we have uh, one question is from uh, Dr. Hartley, one of our new attendees. And he refers back to the map that you had of Canyon City, where the street numbers for the 300 on 3rd Street yes. are 600 series numbers. And you said that they changed to the 300. Yes. Jessica's also been doing some research while you've been talking, and she has some ideas as well. Jessica, you want to address that? And Terry, you want to talk about it as well? Jessica? Well, actually, I'll first bounce it back to Terry. Do you have an answer as to why or when or how that changed? Um, I don't know um, why it changed um, other than with the de with the development of the community, um, the it was it was necessary for uniformity so that you want all of your numbers between second and third street to be 300 numbers and for the parallel streets to all match so that there is consistency across the board. That would be my theory. I honestly do not know. Um, the original numbers might have come from um, just early platting, um, early mapping of the town, um, further research to be <laughs> conducted. Yes. Um, I don't know off the top of my head either, so I'm going to have to dig into that a little bit more, but my thoughts were right along with you, um, in that it was, it may have just, I mean, by that time, Canyon City had been established for 11 years. Maybe it was just time to, to restructure the way that was organized, um, and did, you know, even before that in your presentation, you talked about how some street names had changed and then some of these numberings had changed. Um, and we see that quite a bit, even Canyon City, um, River Street, Cyanide, there's a number of them that have uh, been renamed at different locations, which can make it confusing or don't exist at all anymore. Um, one thing I've found is comparing the maps and looking for landmarks. And to yes. compare to you or the, you know, um, the street layout and the grid around it. But even that can be tricky because um, like the river has changed course since some of these early maps. And so trying to reference against that can be a little bit tricky. Also, in terms of renaming of streets, um, city directories, um, in many cases, um, I know I had family that lived in Brenham, Texas, and they uh, went through and renamed several of the streets. And the city directories do have a cross directory that says that what uh, street number A was in the 1870s, now in the early 1900s, is a different name. Oh, that's good. So city directories can also help with um, determining that information. 
I said at the start that when using Sanborn maps, use other um, mapping tools, other um, internet resources, as well as what you know from your own family history, um, the census research, research that you've done, the city directory research that you've done, so that you too can see what some of those changes might have been. Yeah, so thank you so much for your question. We will research that and hopefully you can come back next uh, next month for genealogy um, and we can have a better answer to that. In the meantime, I'm, I've got a few more things to note on, but if anybody else has questions, we love having this discussion piece. So go ahead and drop your questions or comments or stories into the little chat feed feature. Um, just click on it at the bottom of your page there. Um, right now, we'd love to hear from you. We've got a few minutes still. Um, but one thing that, that um, I was going to kind of go back to um, as far as the street names and numbering, it reminded me um, we went to a program up in Cotopaxi, Colorado. I guess that was probably about two years ago now. Um, but part of their history was that the houses, the properties there weren't numbered until the 1970s. And all of the the survey lines um, were drawn in reference to the railroad tracks. Well, at some point, a siding was put in, and so it wasn't specified um, in the surveys if it was from the main or from the siding. And so there ended up being disputes because the um, the property descriptions were like, seven feet from the tracks, blue house. Well, house colors changed. And like I said, there was now two railroads where there once was one and it created some confusion. So what a wonderful, unique story. Yes. Until the <laughs> 1970s. Um, one other thing I was just gonna touch on the Reynolds Bank building, you posted a picture of that and an interesting, just a little fun fact about that building. When it was originally built, it had two owners, um, and it wasn't a partnership in owning the building. The building had two owners. The so part of the building was owned by one gentleman, the other part by the other. However, they shared the stairwell. They were both responsible for the stairwell. So, And on the Sanborn map, um, there is actually a line, a solid line, um, on the first floor of that building. Um, that indicates a solid um, division between the two quote unquote structures. Interesting. Well, do we have any other questions? All right, guys. So thank you so much. Um, and we hope to see you again next month uh, as we talk about the Pony Express. We will get some answers, some better answers to why Main Street was renumbered. And then just one more thing, a couple of things coming up at the museum um, on September 21st and September 28th, the Friends of the Museum is hosting their movie night. And so we'll be featuring movies that were filmed, partially filmed in Canyon City. So on the 21st will be the 1974 film, Mr. Majestic, starring Charles Bronson. And then on September 28th will be Our Souls at Night, starring Robert Redford and Jane Fonda, filmed in 2017. And then September 30th, we have our Fall Hike with a Paleontologist. And so these are really fun events. They fill up fast. So keep an eye out if that's something you're interested in. Uh, Museum.canyoncity.org. Thank you so much. <laughs>